because this area is so small, right? I feel like church, you can still see people in the corner of your eye. Good morning, church. You might look at me. Good morning. Welcome. Happy Easter. The Lord is risen.
Announcements this morning. Youth is not happening tonight, but it'll pick up again next Sunday um, because it's Easter. And youth needs to be with their family. So, no youth tonight, next week, next Sunday. Um, and then we are bringing Grief Share. We're going to do Grief Share starting on May 16th. Our 
actually going to be at Sterlini Coffee. Uh, they have graciously opened up their business to host it for us, so praise God for that. Three shares here. And with that, yes, ma'am. What is grief share? Excellent. Anyone who's lost a loved one, could be a spouse, could be a child, um, could be a parent, grief share is there to come alongside you and support you in a group setting um, to help um, deal with the grief and the sorrow and the joy. Not that that's not that you. What do I want to say? It's okay to have those emotions and to help walk you through those emotions. Okay, so that's what grief share is. Thank you for bringing that up, Christy. So. And with that, Luke chapter 24, we're going to talk about the resurrection this morning. Everybody have a Bible? Anybody need a Bible? Anybody need candy? for this morning. We truly, truly, truly thank you for this morning that we can celebrate. We have the opportunity to celebrate, to remember, to praise you for the life of your son who did die on the cross but has been resurrected. And we celebrate that this morning, his rising. And Lord, we don't celebrate, we don't follow someone who's dead and buried. We follow you, Jesus, who is alive and living and breathing and have come to save us. And it's through your work on the cross and through your resurrection that we can find life. And we can have hope. So we truly thank you this morning. Lord, may you put things aside in our hearts and help us to focus just on you this morning. Help us to keep you front and center. Because this is what it's all about. Jesus, you are who it's all about. So may you be in our hearts. And it's in your name we pray these things, Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Luke chapter 24. Pick up in verse 1 here. It says, Around the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went and sat, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Verse 6, He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified on the third, be crucified on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So today is a very special day for us, a blessed day, because we have the privilege to celebrate Easter and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, as the Bible tells us, was arrested, went to trial, he was spat on, he was slapped in the face, he was mocked, he was scourged. His body was beaten and broken, a crown of thorns was on his head, and ultimately nailed to a Roman cross. Nails piercing his hands and his feet, and then died and was buried in a tomb with a large stone rolled in front of the entrance. The Savior of the world, the Christ, was dead, wrapped in linen. And for three days the Son of God would lay there. And if we're not careful, we will miss a key aspect of this powerful moment, this event. That through his arrest and crucifixion, his life and death, we see the ultimate demonstration of love 
the world will ever know. Jesus told his disciples prior to his arrest that if they truly loved him, they would obey his commandments. They would love God and love others. And they would need to show their love instead of just saying it. They would need to demonstrate it. Love is something that can be said, but it's much more powerful, more convict, convincing and real when it's demonstrated. When we can see it, when we can palpate it. And again, the most powerful demonstration we have known or will ever know is Jesus hanging on that cross. Because of out of that collaboration between the Father and the Son, we can understand how much we are truly loved. And how much God desires for you to be reconciled to Him, to be restored to Him into an everlasting fellowship with Him. Rescued from the judgment that awaits us because of our sin, our mistakes, our trespasses. It was Jesus' life given in place of yours. His life offered in place of yours and mine to bear the penalty and punishment of our sin on His body so we would not have to. So you would not have to. To be forgiven and once again dwell with the Father. If you have your Bible, flip over to Romans chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 5. <clears throat> Just to the right a little bit, Romans chapter 5. We'll pick up in verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God shows his love for us how? Christ dying for us. Jesus hung on that cross out of his love for his enemies. Those who are in complete rebellion towards God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the innocent was punished for the guilty. And that's the Father's heart for you, that you would come into a saving relationship with him through his Son, and what he accomplished on the cross. But, we praise God too, because the Lord's body did not remain in that tomb, lifeless and cold. He's no longer dead and buried, but he's alive and he's free. Living and breathing, conquering sin and conquering death. The stone has been rolled away and the tomb is now empty. And this Easter, as we celebrate his resurrection, we're going to head back to that tomb. As we approach that tomb, we need to keep a few things in mind as we celebrate today. Flip over back to Luke chapter 24. Pick up in verse 1 with me again. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them, dazzling in peril. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? So as we return to the tomb this morning, we need to have that right expectation. We need to have the right understanding of what's inside. In other words, what are you expecting to see as you look inside the tomb? These women, Luke tells us, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with, with them who are headed towards the tomb where Jesus' body was laid, what were they expecting to find? They were anticipating finding Jesus' body still there, dead, lifeless, and cold. How do we know that? Because they brought with them prepared spices and ointments for his lifeless body and to finish giving him a proper burial, which was customary back then. After the loss of a loved one, to come and anoint the body with sweet-smelling spices and perfumes. 
They also expected the stone to still be blocking the entrance. Trying to figure out how or who would roll the stone away, Mark in his Gospel, chapter 16, verse 3, he says they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Because they believed the Lord's body was still behind it. And that stone was still on the way. And who could blame them, right? Who could blame them for what they expected? They watched as his body was ripped apart. They watched as his hands and feet were pierced. They watched as Jesus breathed his last breath. And they watched as his lifeless body was lowered from the cross and wrapped in linen. And they watched as he was laid in the tomb. And they watched as the stone was rolled in front of the entrance. It would seem that death had won. It would seem that death had won. And so we also see too from their reactions what they had expected as they made their way to the tomb. Luke tells us that the women found the stone rolled away. And when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. My Bible says they were perplexed. They, in other words, they were baffled. They were baffled because his body was supposed to be there. Where did Jesus go? <laughs> And then all of a sudden we have two angels appearing that show up, they're all bedazzled, asking the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? And they anticipated finding the body of Jesus still lying there among those who have passed on, who have died before him. When they woke up that Sunday morning, their plans that day were to go and to anoint him and finish the burial process for his body. His body. In their understanding, <clears throat> in their mind, they understood that death had victory over Jesus. In their mind, they understood that death had victory over Jesus. But what their, what their understanding and what they expected wasn't completely true. Yes, Jesus' body did cease for a time. He died, but he's no longer dead. He's now alive. And he's risen. Death did not get the victory over Jesus. No, Jesus, our Savior, has gotten the victory over death. How do we know? Verse 6, Luke writes, He says, He is not here, but has risen. He is not here, He has risen. He's alive, and the tomb is empty, the tomb is vac vacant. And what seems so final, so impossible to overcome, such as death, Jesus now holds the keys to. Flip over to Revelation chapter 1. Last book of the Bible on your right. Revelation chapter 1. Pick up in verse 17. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Verse 18. And the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. He holds the keys. The believer of the church does not have to fear death anymore because Jesus has conquered it forever. He holds the keys. He is in control because he is alive. And again, what sets true Christianity apart from everything else that's out there is that we follow, we serve, we believe in a Savior who's not lying in a tomb dead we follow, we serve, we believe in Jesus who is alive, who is not who, who not only paid for our sin, but also gives us gives us life in his name. So when we approach the tomb, when we head back there, what we expect to find is only some linen cloth and not Jesus. We should expect to find an empty tomb. Because our Savior is alive. He's alive. And secondly, as we head back to the tomb this morning, we find that we also need to remember what we have been told. 
back in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Verse 6 again. The angel says, He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. The angels point the women back to what Jesus had told them previously, to his words he had spoken, and what must take place. Where do we find that? Luke chapter 18, just to the left a little bit. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. This is the third time Jesus was telling his followers that he must be handed over. He must be crucified, and then he would be resurrected to fulfill what was written about him. But the disciples couldn't understand how this fits into God's plan for the Messiah, who, in their minds, at least, were expecting the Messiah to be uh, to overthrow Rome and to establish his kingdom on earth. But these events were all part of God's plan to redeem mankind from sin. And showing us that the Father is sovereign, that the Father is in control over all things, including death itself. And what comfort that should bring, assuring us that we can trust Him and we can follow Him. What joy that should bring us as well, because now that Jesus is alive, that means He truly is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And that he did pay for your sin, and he paid for my sin on the cross, so that we can receive forgiveness. We can be reconciled to the Father. And all that he asks of us, all that he requires, is that we believe. That we believe. Which brings us to our third point that we find as we go back to the tomb. Look at verse 9 in Luke chapter 24. Says, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Verse 11, but these words seemed to them as idle tale, and they did not believe them. They did not believe them. These first witnesses, these women came back and informed the eleven and everyone else that they had seen what they had seen, but instead of taking this truth, they classified it as an idle tale, a story, a fictional story, and not trustworthy. Most of the apostles and the people gathered did not believe the women's testimony. They were stuck in that same mindset that death had won, that death had claimed another life, that Jesus would forever lay in that tomb behind the stone door. And what's interesting as we look at each gospel account, as we go through the resurrection um, account through each gospel, we find that the stone was already moved when the women arrived. But it wasn't moved so Jesus could get out. The stone was not moved so Jesus could get out. The stone was moved to allow his followers to get in to get in, to be the witness, so they could see and have proof that Jesus was not there and that he has been resurrected, so they could believe. So they could believe, which is all that the Lord asks of us. For us to have our sins forgiven and to receive everlasting life, all we have to do is believe. Believe that Jesus died and he rose again. The Bible puts it this way, that if we confess our 
if we can confess our sin with our mouth that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Which brings us to our last point this Easter Sunday as we return to the tomb. The Lord's resurrection should cause us to marvel at what has been accomplished, that Jesus is alive. Look at verse 12 of Luke chapter 24. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter, hearing the testimony of the women, got up and ran to the tomb, going in and only seeing the, the linen cloths that were left behind. And it says he went home marveling at what had happened. He was amazed. He was filled with wonder upon seeing the empty tomb. And guess what? We should be too. We should be too. That God has raised Jesus back to life. He has been resurrected, having conquered sin, and now conquering death. It's truly amazing. It's truly amazing that life is found in God. And that not even death itself can stop our Almighty Father. He has the power to give life. And what's even more amazing, what we should be marveling at, is that he offers the same life to you as well. It is a gift that he freely gives. And one we definitely don't deserve. Flip over to Romans chapter 6 again. Romans chapter 6. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a flipper. Romans chapter 6. Six, verse 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord the wages of sin is death what we earn what we deserve what we are entitled to is not life but it's death we, we deserve to be in that tomb we should have that stone blocking our exit we should not be allowed out but God has given us a way out. He has provided us a way of escape. He offers us a gift. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's free. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do all these good deeds or follow rituals or give a certain amount of money or be a certain at a certain point or status, we come as we are because all we ask is that we just believe. And it's a gift. We have to receive it. <clears throat> we have to receive it. And by doing so, we are no longer an enemy with God, but now in fellowship with Him. No longer dead and buried in our own tomb, but able to rise and leave sin and death behind. Because of Jesus, because of his life, his death, and certainly his resurrection we celebrate today. So as we approach the tomb where the Lord's body was laid, have that expectation that the stone has been moved and that Jesus isn't there anymore. The tomb is empty. <clears throat> Remember that this was God's divine plan from the beginning. To rescue mankind from sin and death so we could receive forgiveness. We can receive life. But we have to believe. We have to accept and receive the testimony from these eyewitnesses from God's word. That Jesus is alive and that he has conquered sin and death and he offers us Again, that should be amazing to us. It's amazing to me that God would demonstrate his love 
towards us, his enemies, towards you and me by sending his son to be your ransom, to redeem you. And that through his death on the cross and his resurrection this third day, you can rise from your tomb and leave the darkness behind. And if that's you, if you are ready to leave the old life behind and find new life in Jesus, I would ask you to raise your hand. If you're ready to step out of that tomb, to leave death behind and find life, I would ask you to raise your hand so I can see you. So we can pray for you. We deserve death because of our sin. But God has given us an opportunity to receive his free gift of life through his son, Jesus Christ. If you are ready to receive that gift, raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know who you are so I can pray with you. Wait until tomorrow. Today is the day. No one's guaranteed tomorrow. close down. Remember, death has been conquered, and a new life awaits, all by the power of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today, that He is risen, He is alive, and He is at work, seeking and saving the lost. celebrate the rising of your son that through his death and resurrection we can be forgiven we can have life and we can be with you thank you father for loving us thank you Jesus for dying for us thank you for paying for our sin that's what Easter is all about. And Jesus, you came to hang on that cross. You came to die for us so we could be forgiven. And you rose on that third day so that we could have life. Thank you for rolling the stone away, offering a chance to escape death, to come out of the darkness, and to come into the light. Help us remember this every day, not just Easter, but every day. Lord, that we are here for you, because you were here and are here for us. Share your message of hope. That sin and death have no power over us when we trust in your name. Thank you. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Right. We're going to do some communion here in just a minute. Don't spill the juice on the carpet. Just kidding.
celebrate communion, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, his broken body, and the blood that he shed. So if you would like to partake, feel free to grab a cup. There's two cups there, one has the bread, one has the juice. Everybody have one that wants one. Alright. Alright, so the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And before... Life could be given, the life had to be offered. The body had to be broken. And that's what communion is, is to remind us of that body being broken and that sin being atoned for. And that cracker, that bread, represents his body, the scourging that he endured, and the life that was paid. Go ahead and partake of the bread. And he took the wine and passed it around and gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my blood which has been given up for you, given to you. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Again, before life could be offered, blood had to be shed. A sacrifice had to be made. And it was his blood, his life, his body that offers us and gives us that forgiveness of sin. So we celebrate this. Celebrate that this morning too. Go ahead and partake. All right. We'll close it down with a little worship.
Thank you. 